So, the MX250. Just got this in the latest model of HP's NV13. I, I love this new laptop. I actually had the 2017 model before it disappeared. Don't know where it is. Probably find it... Uh, under the floorboards of my house at some point in a few months. But because I travel so much and do so much work on the go, I needed to replace it, and this was still the best deal. Um, and it came with a better Whiskey Lake i7 and faster RAM, better RAM, better storage, a nicer screen. Really, I will have a full review for this laptop. It is significantly better than the two-year-old model than I thought it would be, even though on the outside and in the spec sheet it looks almost the same. No, no, no. It's quite a bit better. Um, and on that note, though, the thing that also really surprised me is the MX250, because I really did not expect this to be much better than the MX150. Uh, really, these on paper are almost the exact same graphics card, except the MX250 is clocked like 10% faster. But the truth is, Samsung's 14 nanometer process, which is what this die is made on, unlike the rest of Pascal, has clearly matured over the years. Um, this thing holds boost clocks I would say at stock, at least 20-30% higher. You can really expect about a 20% performance boost with this thing. And it overclocks quite a bit better as well. Now, here's the thing, though. This isn't just a review, you know, uh, of what is essentially a mobile version of the GT1030. This is a guide to how to turn those pesky 10-watt versions into the same performance as a GT1030 without throttling. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, I'll tell you why. This laptop is thinner and has overall, I believe in every direction, smaller dimensions than a MacBook Air. This is tiny, all right? And yet it has a full quad-core i7 that turbos to 4.6 gigahertz and a dedicated graphics card. Now, it's barely dedicated. Clearly, NVIDIA saw a gap in the market they could really take advantage of a few years ago. Intel wasn't going to be updating their integrated graphics until, well, I guess until 2020, right? And so if they're not, if they're basically just rebranding the same Skylake or arguably Broadwell integrated graphics over and over and over, laptop manufacturers aren't going to be happy about that. So NVIDIA stepped in with this 71 um, millimeter squared ultra tiny chip that effectively the idea at least is this can be fit into any laptop with almost no added space there's there should always be enough room to add a graphics card this small in here and there is but so that they can fit it in here nvidia allows for a 10 watt tdp limit now the normal one is 25 watts you know maybe slightly less than a gt 1030 which tends to go at about 30 35 you know the best yields of a gt 1030 um, and, and yeah, that is so that they can effectively share the cooling system with the i7, and then they can brand it as having NVIDIA graphics without the thing melting. But what's so annoying is that 10 watt TDP limit can make it perform half as well, and also throttle your CPU, giving you horrible performance in some games, when it need not be. Not if you undervolt it. But undervolting is locked out, at least in most applications. But not the one I used. I figured out how to effectively cap boost clocks, overclock the RAM past 8,000 megahertz effective. That's right, all the way up to about 8,200, giving you a 1, 2, 3... Almost, I think, no, 35% bandwidth boost. That easily makes up for capping the boost clock at about 1,200 to 1,300 megahertz, which is about the desktop card does anyways. This performs like a GT1030 with a massive undervolt while using about 8 watts. Ladies and gentlemen, with these settings, this is pretty much the most efficient graphics card on Earth, even if it isn't that powerful. An 8-watt, once configured correctly, an 8-watt graphics card that can play the Division 2 online with your friends, not at glorious settings, but respectable settings that can play Battlefield 5 and 900p capped. I've capped it at 33 frames a second. Multiplayer with like if I'm on the go, let's fire up a quick team deathmatch or conquest match. That's what you get an ultra portable, powerful laptop for. So let's go into how I did that. All right, so like I said, this is for the MX250, its own overclocking guide. Uh, you want to use Asus GPU 
tweak too. You have to use this. MSI Afterburner will not work. And let's go to default settings just so you guys see what this looks like once you boot it up, right? Um, this should adjust itself. There it is. So these are these are default settings, which is woefully slower GDR5, which in 2019 is ridiculous. GDR5 has been produced for 15 years now. It can go above 6,000 megahertz. Basically, all of it can. So let's take a look at the user defined, because this is the real trick, guys. This is the real, real trick. See this? It boosts from this voltage here to maximum this voltage all the way up to 1800 megahertz and it does do that but you really aren't ever going to maintain that and it is impressive for like a one minute benchmark i'll have to admit uh, i was playing battlefield 5 and 900p in the single player campaign at 60 frames a second and like medium settings that was impressive but it will start saturating this laptop with heat, and it will start massively throttling. So here's the trick, guys. This is the trick. This is the trick that allows you to undervolt this mobile graphics card. Linear. And you just move this so it's a straight line. Now, mine was stable, I believe, around here. I don't remember, but we'll go. And it has to be exactly straight. These numbers need to be the same. Now, what does that do? That makes it so that it instantly boosts to 1200, like I'll boost a little higher actually, like I don't know, 1260 megahertz. And while well, it's at 1260 megahertz, since it's not moving up and down, since it's linear, it will use the bottom voltage. Effectively, you just did a minus 500 millivolt undervolt. I'm not kidding people. And what this does is this turns this into an 8 watt. Uh, mobile gaming graphics card. It, it's absolutely ridiculous this actually works. And so then you have to save that. I'm not going to because I got my own settings. And then, of course, max out memory. But you can actually max it out more than you would think. Now, let me show you this other dumb, dumb trick. Now, if you go to settings, uh, I have this obviously start up when Windows starts. And I have it apply settings when it boots up. And I've had no issues with that, by the way. I know MSI Afterburner can be glitchy. This program used to be glitchy if you have it boot with startup. No such issues. It, it just boots up. It's in the background. I don't even have to look at it. It's never not applied the overclock at boot up. So I have to actually do this to show you what I'm talking about. Let's see. All right. So there we go. Now let's go back to home. Advanced mode. Still maxed out here, right, guys? Still right maxed out here. Now, what you got to do is go back to the settings, overclocking range enhancement. There's no folder you need to, like, copy and paste something into. There's no idiotic things like that that MSI makes you do either. So you do apply. And if you go back, it should. Look at that. And it really will apply this, people. It really will <laughs> let you go that high. And this would freeze instantly if I hit apply. Now, what I got this stable at was about right, I believe, here. So I did get that extra 5% bandwidth. And it will. it's a 64-bit graphics card. So any clock speed increases you can get will yield more performance, almost linearly. And then what you're also going to want to do is set a frame rate target. Now, this will be different per laptop. But for me, I just settled on 33. At 33 frames, it never drops below 33. It feels a hair smoother than 30. And it's just a locked 33. I know, 60 is great and all, but this is a laptop, a very thin one. It will saturate with heat and start throttling permanently for an hour if you do not do this. This is so you cap how much energy everything's using and don't saturate with heat. I recommend 33. Most people would just use 30. I know some people might get away with 40 if the laptop's a little bigger. You have an MX250. I really recommend this, really. Really think about it. Are you actually going to game at 60 frames minimum on this thing? No, this is just so you can quick and dirty play a little Battlefield, a little Division 2 online with your friends when you're on the go. 33 is fine, guys. Don't be greedy. This is why you have a desktop. So in your home, you can game in glorious 144 hertz. But on the go, all that should matter is the fact that you can actually play. And this keeps you playing no matter where you are. 
And of course, normally I would hit apply. I'm not going to right now. Uh, and then you would, of course, come here, and a little button would pop up that lets you save it. Um, but I'm going to hit cancel, and I'm going to load my standard settings because there's one more trick you need to be aware of. Now, apply. Okay. Now, right now, it looks correct. I don't know if I can get it to be stupid or not. Yeah, so right now it looks correct. These are my normal settings. Okay. And you can see they've obviously applied here. Uh, but the one thing you need to understand is this. Once you save this, all right, let me see. Uh, yeah, so let me see if I can. All right, so let me see if I can close this actually. Is it closed? I think it is. Let me double check. Because there is something that's going to throw some of you off. I really do need to make sure I mention. Remember, the performance right now is just because I'm capturing while I talk to you guys. Yeah, I think. Okay. So let's see if it does it if I reopen it. And I'm opening it. Again. And again, the lagginess is that I'm overclocking while capturing. <laughs> it's not exactly stable that way. All right. Let's see. Yeah, there's the glitch. Okay. So here's what you got to remember. When, you, when this boots up with start, as long as you did actually save uh, your setting... As long as you did actually tell it to, as long as this is actually enabled, you know, it starts with startup and you did save this correctly and have it all set to boot and apply your overclock when you boot up your laptop. Notice it shows the memory at 8,000. The overclocking enhancements are gone. This is clearly something locked out where they don't want you to know about this glitch. So there is something in the drivers trying to prevent you from overclocking the memory further. The good news is, it is applied. I know it's applied. I verified it with benchmarks. It is staying applied. So just don't worry about it. Once you figure out your stable overclock, save it, put it in here, you know, tell it to boot up and apply it when you start, and it will always apply it correctly. Even though it shows in this software, it isn't applying correctly. So that really is the, you know, overview of how you can turn a 10-watt MX250 into a desktop GT1030 in an ultra thin and light laptop. This is how you avoid this being nothing but a marketing graphics card. Because frankly, at stock settings on most of these thin laptops, it just throttles and it performs at best twice as good as integrated graphics. But you can make it perform four or five times better than Intel's integrated graphics. You're not, you know, this isn't for competitive gaming, but this will allow you to play. I think every game out now, I can't think, a if I can play the Division 2 in Battlefield 5 multiplayer, I, I can't think of a game that won't let you play at some setting. And you can play all those at about 30 frames, 720p low, when you're on the go, boot up a quick team deathmatch with some friends. That's what's great about it. And uh, I'm not going to run this whole thing because there's no point. It's capturing, so the final results won't be accurate. But I'm just going to show you it here really quick so you do see it is boosting to this. And then I will show a bar graph comparing various superposition results. Again, this isn't meant to be a graphics card performance comparison. This is just me showing you what you would get at stock and what you get after, you know, final overclocking compared to a few desktop cards and at least one uh, benchmark. And so, yeah, there you go. I pulled some interesting results I could find just to give you points of comparison. At stock settings, indeed, the MX250 gets about 1950 in Unigine superposition. Uh, I don't actually remember exactly what my old MX150 got, but I think it was around 18, 17, 1600 at stock. So, yeah, this was like 10% stronger at stock. But once you overclock it, this is a good 15% stronger than I think any score I could get that MX152. And the important thing to remember is I remember my MX150. Um, with the same principles applied, maxing out at about 1100 megahertz, you know, instead of 1260. And it would get to about 75 degrees. Well, this one here never gets above 70. So it's holding, you know, 15% higher uh, performance in this benchmark while also running like five degrees cooler with basically the same exact chassis and cooling system as the previous so this is a really good one-to-one -one comparison and as you can see yeah it's a gt1030 now and i just think it's funny to also put it next to it's not that far away from the old 350 watt gtx 480 look how far we've come people <laughs> um 
And remember that Unigine is a very core, you know, teraflops heavy uh, in terms of uh, getting better results from overclocking. I, I definitely got a good 20-30% boost from overclocking the memory in a couple of games like The Division that can really leverage that high performance. But yeah, not an overall comparison trying to show how strong this card is to other cards, but I did take one point of comparison so you can at least get a rough idea of what kind of gaming you'll be able to do with this little 8-watt graphics card. Oh, and how about some quick power consumption results? Yep, during basic tasks like web browsing, using Chrome, it uses about 24 watts, which makes sense. I booted up Intel Burn Test to give us a point of comparison, and yeah, the whole thing was using about 44 watts at this point. And what's really interesting, just to prove my point of how efficient this graphics card is, once you started playing Battlefield 5 multiplayer, and this is a 900p, a 64-player game, the thing was using, I didn't see it get a, this is actually the highest I saw it get, 46 watts. That's it, people. And remember, it is basically turning off the integrated Intel uh, graphics. So maybe you save a few watts there. But yeah, what is that? So yeah, overall, this graphics card's using like 7 to 8 watts while gaming in a 64-player multiplayer. So yeah, so my overall review of the MX250 is that it is incredibly impressive. And an example of a type of mobile graphics card I hope AMD and NVIDIA and Intel continue to explore. You know, these 10 to 20 watt graphics cards that can fit into ultra-thin MacBook Air-sized netbooks, the types of things that usually don't have any graphics card, but this one does. And I guess the only annoying thing I would say is HP, this is 0.7 inches thick at its thickest part. This is not <laughs> thick at all. Add 0.1 more inches so that you can beef up the heat sink, and then don't be afraid to make the fan a little more powerful. It's completely silent at all times, but if I was gaming, I would not mind if the fan ramped up, you know, maybe to a 30-50% higher speed. Because I certainly wouldn't hear it while I'm doing something. So, just food for thought, but a very impressive graphics card. And you can turn this 10-watt card into something that games on the go and performs like a GT 1030 or like a GTX 560. <laughs> Isn't that funny? All right. Tell me what you think in the comment section below. I hope you found this helpful. Please share it. I don't think almost anyone knows this. Tons of complaints about the MX150 and 250, but they don't need to suck if they're the 10-watt version. And of course, please subscribe if you're watching my videos. Ring the bell button. And if you want to talk with me about more overclocking advice, not just from me, by the way, but to all the other people on the Discord, support me on Patreon. We are exchanging some really cool results we're getting in all types of different hardware, not just your standard run-of-the-mill stuff everyone else is talking about. All right, thank you. Thank you.